All right, this morning we're returning to the Gospel of Matthew. We're nearing the end. We're actually in chapter 27, the end of chapter 27, and also we'll be starting in chapter 28. Chapter 28 is the last chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. And the title this morning is Christ's Grace, Disgrace, and Glory. We'll be looking at his burial and his resurrection. I want to read from verse 57 in Matthew 27. <clears throat> and then go into Matthew 28, all the way to verse 8. <clears throat> Scripture says, When it was evening, there came a rich man for, from Arimathea, named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus, then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock. And he rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb and went away. And Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite the grave. Now on the next day, the day after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees ordered, I'm sorry, gathered together with Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that deceiver said, After three days I am to rise again. Therefore, give orders to the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal him away and say to the people, He has risen from the dead, and the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have, you have a guard. Go, make it as secure as you know how. And they went and made the grave secure, and along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. Moving into chapter 28 now, verse 1. Now after the Sabbath, as it began to draw toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like the lightning, was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, just as he said. Come, see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. And behold, I have told you. And they uh, left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. May the Lord bless you. His word to us, it is his living word, and may he bless it to us this morning. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for these words, and uh, Lord, we thank you that the word of God is infallible. It is the living word of God given to us by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and we thank you that we have before us is the actual word of God speaking to us. It is as fresh as when it was first given back 2,000 years ago and beyond. We thank you, Lord, for these words, for it is an account of the a record, a, an accurate historical record of the death of Christ and also his resurrection, uh, that which is the central theme in the Christian uh, gospel. So now, Lord, we ask for your blessing. Bless each one and that you may indeed uh, give us uh, hearts uh, uh, to rejoice in. Lord, that uh, as we think of the victory of Christ on the cross, we pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. So we've seen before that the cross is the greatest event in all of history. <clears throat> it is also the greatest of all of God's works. It's his masterpiece, greater than creation itself. Because with creation, what God has given his physical life, but through the cross, God is giving us spiritual life. And it is the greatest work of God. For it is at the cross where God, in human flesh, chose to 
uh, receive upon himself our sins and punishment. I was thinking about this this morning as I, as I was reviewing. It's like a, a judge in the courtroom, and there's a person in front of him who's guilty as charged. And he owes a million dollars, for example. And so the, uh, the person who's guilty cries out, uh, have mercy. And uh, so the judge shows mercy. He removes his robe as a judge. He steps down and he sits, stands, stands next to him and he pays his debt. And then afterwards, the judge goes back up and he says, you're acquitted. Your debt has been paid in full. And this is what God has done, isn't it? He has paid our debt, what we owed him. It is at the cross that God reconciled us to himself through the shed blood of Christ. There's no other way. There was no other way. This was foreordained from before the foundation of the world, something that we can't comprehend. We can't. I can't wrap my mind around that because, you know, this is a divine thing. It is from God himself. I love the verse in 2 Corinthians 5.21. It says here, for our sake, for our sake, for our benefit, for our blessing, He, the Father, God, made Him, Jesus, to be sin. Christ became a sin sacrifice for us, who, what, knew no sin. Christ never sinned. He was tempted in every way, just like us, yet without sin. So that in Him, it says, we might become the righteousness of God. It is only through the shed blood of Christ and His victory at the cross that we have righteousness. God's gift to us. In the eyes of the common people, <clears throat> all they saw regarding the Lord Jesus Christ was a man who died a senseless death. He was just a man like, like everyone else. And no one was aware that something much deeper was actually going on, deeper than what appeared on the surface. For it was, at, uh, it was only after Christ's resurrection that the disciples were able to piece, uh, put the pieces together. And then they understood. Remember on the day of Pentecost? Peter, <laughs> they, you know, Peter denied Christ. All the disciples fled when Christ was arrested. And, and Christ, uh, afterwards, he rose from the dead, and now they're trying to put the pieces together. And on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit came with power upon the Holy Church, uh, upon the Church of God, and then they understood. The pieces were put together, and Peter preached a bold and powerful sermon. And how many people were converted on that day? 3,000 people. 3,000, and many others were converted afterwards. For on the cross, Christ made atonement for our sins, and the wrath of the, God, uh, the, wrath of the Father was poured out upon Christ the Son, where God's anger against us was averted and turned away. Only a sinless man could qualify. A, only the spotless Lamb of God Qualified and was willing to be our substitute. For it was planned and it was decided before anything existed for a Savior, for Christ, to put on human flesh. These are things that are, again, beyond our comprehension, but we know is what we see in Scripture. So if we compare this to the Old Testament, uh, Leviticus 16, 21, it says the following, And Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of a live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all, this, uh, and all their transgressions and all their sins. In essence, this is what happened to Christ on the cross. Our sins were confessed upon the head of the Lord Jesus Christ, who was the Lamb of God, who is our, our scapegoat, and, and he received our punishment so that we will not be punished. That's God's great gift. I mean, I should be more excited about this. Are we not excited about this? This is great news. This is wonderful news. Furthermore, we see in Exodus 12, 5, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year, a male, a year old. You shall take it from among the sheep or from the goats. So this is a picture of Christ. This is the Passover lamb. In 1 Peter 1, 18, it says, In knowing that you were... Uh, we're, we're ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without spot or blemish. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Passover lamb had to die 
even though, even though, sorry, even so, Christ had to die, there was no other way. Christ had to die. We saw last week the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> it says in Matthew 27, verse 50, and Jesus cried out again, and what he spoke, uh, it's recorded in the other Gospels, and again with a loud voice, and yielded up his spirit. He chose to yield up his spirit. Jesus says, no one takes my life, I lay it down on myself, I have power to take it up again, as we will see a bit later on. Thus again, we have before us, uh, in here in Matthew 27 and Matthew 28, a descriptive text. It is describing the historical events, the facts of what has happened, and it is rooted in history. And uh, the question here before us, what happened? What, ha what happened after Christ died on the cross? There he was on the cross. There he died. Well, we know he was taken down. And let's see what it says. So my point, uh, number one, my first point is, we see here in Matthew 27, secret believers... They show some courage. Years ago, I read a book, and I found it in my library uh, last night, and it's called Secret Believers. It's about the uh, account of the many believers in Islamic countries where they are actually believers, true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's really a fascinating book, uh, written by Brother Andrew, by the Ministry of Endorse. And so we see this in today in uh, modern-day Islamic nations where there are many Christians, more than what we believe. And we can say the same thing regarding these Jewish believers here in the days of Jesus and why they chose to remain silent. Well, we know that they're maybe baby Christians, they're, they're weak in the faith, um, maybe uh, not uh, demonstrating a great deal of courage or maybe a, a kind of a strategy. But in any case, we see here, not, all, not just one, but we'll see two. So we see the first one is Joseph of Arimathea. Verse 57 says the following. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph. Arimathea was a little town, uh, I think 22 kilometers, 22 miles north of, of Jerusalem. And um, it says here, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. So he was a disciple of Jesus. He was a true believer. Now the regular executed criminals, in most cases, they never received a dignified burial. Uh, what the, the Romans would do, I'm not sure, whether they were just all the, these criminals were thrown in the same place, they would dig a hole, just throw them there. Uh, and so this was something the Jews, they, 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 they would respect the, those who had died and as we'll see in scripture here, um, uh, here's a quote from an author. He says, a burial will also prevent the defilement of the land. So they, they, uh, Joseph wanted to make sure that Jesus was buried in the right way. Um, so a burial will also prevent the defilement of the land and in Jewish eyes, which would, which, would cause, sorry, which would be caused by leaving the corpse on the cross overnight. Deuteronomy 21, 22, and 23 says the following. And if a man has committed a crime punishable by death, and he is put to death, and you hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night on the tree, but you shall bury him the same day, for he hanged, uh, a hanged man is cursed by God. You shall not defile your land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. So he wanted to make sure that Jesus was buried in a dignified way, and also according to the scriptures. So who was this Joseph? Well, uh, our verse tells us that he was a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we go to the Gospel of John, we see in John 19, 38, it says here, after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who also was also a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews. That's what it says. He asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took away his body. So it says here in the scriptures, he was secretly a believer. And so he feared the Jews. So again, young believers uh, usually are weak in the faith, and usually they take some time before they can actually develop some courage. The Mark 15 says the following, Mark 15, verse 43, regarding Joseph. It says, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council. Now we have more information here. 
who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage, it says here. So after the death of Jesus, he decided, hey, I've got to do something for Jesus, and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. So interestingly here, Joseph was also a member of the, the council, which is the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin was the gathering uh, on the night of Jesus' betrayal, well, where they had a, an illegal gathering with Caiaphas and others of the Sanhedrin. So uh, it's possible that Joseph was, was not there at that time. Uh, and so it's kind of hard to gather all the, all the, uh, those of the council. So, so it's quite, quite possible that Joseph was not there, but he was a member of the Sanhedrin. This is the, uh, the mafia, if you will. They were in control. They were in charge of Israel, of Judaism. But there was also another person here who showed some courage. And along with Joseph, they together took the body of Jesus. Who was that man? Nicodemus. Nicodemus. And we see that recorded in the Gospel of John. So John 19, 39. It says here, Nicodemus also. So read John chapter 3. He was the one who came to Jesus at night secretly. It says here in verse 39. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, uh, came and bring, <clears throat> bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds of weight. That's heavy. That's a lot of myrrh. So he must have had a lot of money. And so tradition says that he was actually a wealthy man. So they took together. So together they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Thus, as we see here, the fear of men will cause some believers to remain silent about their faith. And uh, let us not be too hard on them. Let us not be too hard on ourselves. You know, we're, we, we're, we're all people who have lack of courage by ourselves. But in, in time, may the Lord strengthen us, mm -hmm. strengthen our faith so that we will be uh, more bold and have the courage to make a stand. Mm -hmm. But these men saw how great an injustice was done to the Lord Jesus Christ. They, they, know, they knew he was an, an innocent man. And so they were not expecting that Christ would rise from the dead. And so they show us some courage by doing this public act. And so I, I really believe that the other authorities would have found out and said, what, Joseph? He, he, uh, he took care of the, the body of Jesus. Why, do we, why would he do that? And look at Nicodemus, a Pharisee. Why would he do that as well? <clears throat> and so I think they both knew that they would find, uh, they would be uh, criticized for their action. Verse 58 to verse 61 says the following. So this man, going back to Matthew 27, speaking only here of, of Joseph, this man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and, uh, and laid it uh, in his own new tomb. So this was a tomb that he had cut out for himself. So he basically gave that tomb over to Jesus, which he had hewn out of out in the rock. Basically, they would create a cave or a cavern for a tomb out of the rock itself. They would chisel their way through whatever they would do. do. And here uh, he rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb and went away. And Mary Magdalene and, and uh, was there, and the other Mary. Who was the other Mary? I thought it was Mary, uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, but it wasn't. It was, apparently, it, it was James, uh, the mother of James and Joseph, and they were sitting up in the opposite room. So they were witnessing the whole thing. So we see here uh, some believers, they were showing some courage uh, after the death of Jesus, and they took care of the body of Jesus. Number two, we see here how the authorities doubled down in their own belief. They doubled down in their own belief. Verse 62 to 64 says the following. Now, on the next day, after the preparation, the chief uh, priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate. So the next day, and said, <clears throat> Sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that deceiver, this is how they, they call him, they call him a deceiver, where in fact they are the ones who are deceivers, said, After three days, I am to rise again. Uh, <clears throat> 
Again, it was in fact the devil who was deceiving them. Verse 64, therefore give orders to the grave that he uh, that need to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal him away and say to the disciples, he is risen from the dead. And the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard? Go make it as secure as you know how. So it's very, uh, very obvious what was going on here. But we see here, what a contrast. What a contrast. Here is... Joseph, and here is Nicodemus, uh, <clears throat> who both have come to faith, two respectable men, they were already respectable in Judaism, but we see that the, uh, the majority strengthened their resolve against Christ. They strengthened their resolve, they doubled down on their resolve against the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, they did not believe, they did not anticipate that Jesus would actually rise from the dead. They didn't see that coming. They only thought that, well, you know, because Jesus spoke those words, that he will rise again, you know, nobody rises from the dead. So they thought, well, obviously, if he mentioned that, maybe they're thinking about actually stealing his body. So, so they only thought that they would actually steal his body and then claim that he rose from the dead. And so in their unbelief, they doubled down. They doubled down in their uh, evil schemes. And so they went to, to Pilate for this matter. And so verse 66 says, And they went and made the grave secure, and along with the guard they set a seal on the stone. So <clears throat> whether it was a Roman soldier or a temple guard, uh, regardless, I think there was a Roman soldier there. And uh, so they, they put a guard there, and they set a seal on the stone. Uh, seal basically was, uh, you, you, you can't touch this. If it's, if it's broken, then obviously somebody tampered with it, and so somebody is guilty of a, of a certain crime. Number three, victory. Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen. In the eyes of all, the crucifixion was a dark day. Literally, it was a dark day. As we see recorded in Matthew 27, verse 45, it says here, Now from the sixth hour... <clears throat> This is 12 noon. There was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And what was this darkness about? This darkness was, was a sign of judgment. Judgment was coming, or has come. How and where and upon whom? Upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Judgment was coming and has come upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Upon the Lord Jesus. Look at the ninth plague in Egypt. In the days of Moses, this was a plague of darkness. And apparently, I read the text the other day just to remind myself of some of the details, and it was so dark, people couldn't even see each other. It was so dark. And that also was a sign of judgment, a sign from God that judgment had come upon the nation of Egypt. Thus, from the darkness of the cross, and now, here early in the morning, we see light the third day verse one good verse one now after the sabbath as it began to dawn before toward the first day of the week that's sunday morning mary magdalene and the other mary the same two marys they were there at the uh, when joseph was there when nicodemus was there and now they were there on sunday morning they came to look at the grave look at what mark says the gospel of mark says Verse 1, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and, and Salome, bought spices so that they might go to, uh, to anoint him, and anoint him. And, uh, let's see here, so this is a further detail on this event. Look at verse 2 in Matthew 27. And behold, it says here, a severe earthquake had occurred for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. Now, this wasn't the only earthquake because it was an earthquake just three days before. Remember at the crucifixion of Christ, Matthew 27, verse 53, it says here, Behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. It was an earthquake at the death of Christ. 
We saw that this was an actual earthquake at the death of Christ that was supernatural. Uh, it was sent by God, and the timing was sent by God, and it occurred at exact, the exact time of Christ's resurrection. Now, here, on the third day, this is the aftershock, Christ's resurrection. For judgment on the day of Christ's death, we see here God sends an earthquake, and here also, with Christ's resurrection, God sends another earthquake, an aftershock. It was a sign of God. So God is speaking. God is speaking loudly. For of necessity, Christ must conquer death and the grave for himself and also for us. The earth, this earthquake and aftershock is God's sign to us. It's God's sign to the people of Israel. He's saying, pay attention. I've accomplished a great work, a great work of judgment upon the Son and also of, of my Son rising from the dead. And God sends an angel to mortal men whom we cannot see. Can we see the angels around us? Are there angels around us right now? I think so. <laughs> I can't see them. And uh, so again, God sent an angel whom we cannot see unless God chooses to make them visible to us. And God chose to make this one angel visible to Mary and Mary. And so this was truly a special occasion. And this may be the same, may have been the same angel who appeared before Joseph in a dream, in a vision, and also maybe to the one who appeared before Mary when Mary conceived. Now, I see some humor from God in this here. Where is the angel exactly? He's sitting. Where in Scripture do we see angels sitting down? I don't recall of one. Unless you have insight that I don't have, that I, I don't remember. But here we see, for the first time, I think, an angel that is sitting down. And so I'm just thinking, like, in my mind, maybe his legs were just swinging back and forth, you know, and maybe he had this big grin on his face. And, you know, wh why would he be doing that? So maybe the, when I see the, this angel in heaven, uh, maybe he'll confront me and say, hey, that was, that was good. <laughs> yes or no, I was, I was not uh, grinning or whatever. Um, but one day he'll, he'll, he'll confirm that to me. But um, here, Blomberg, an author, says, the angel sitting perhaps indicates a note of completion or triumph. And I agree with him. Mm -hmm. Basically saying, it's finished. <laughs> it's done. <laughs> this great act of God. So I'm reminded of Psalm 2. Uh, we've seen this before. Psalm 2, verse 1 and 2, and then also verse 4. It says, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? Uh, the kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. And this exactly is what we see with Christ, how uh, the Jewish authorities, how they seized Christ, and how they had such rage against him. And also regarding uh, Pilate, whom in, in the end he was basically, basically acting as a coward. He didn't care about Jesus, so he, had, in his own way, he was also raging against the Lord Jesus Christ because he's raging against God. But here in verse 4 it says, he who sits, God is sitting in heaven. He laughs. He's laughing. He knows. He wins. So we see here the angel sitting down. And so I'm thinking he had a smile on his face. This is, this is what I think. Verse 2, it says, And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. Now, was, uh, the, was it the earthquake that dislodged the stone so that Jesus could escape? Uh, otherwise, he'd, he'd still be trapped inside. Or was it the angel who set Jesus free? Neither. Neither of those. Because Jesus, in his resurrected, glorified body, now had the power to appear and disappear at will. So there he was in the tomb, he was resurrected right there in the tomb, and there went out by uh, divine power. He, because remember the account where Christ appeared before his disciples after his resurrection. The, the disciples were there in the room out of fear, and then Jesus appeared suddenly before them. And then he left as well. Thus Jesus simply became alive again in the tomb and, transformed, and transported himself out through the walls. 
Uh, I'm reminded of the verse of Jesus uh, in John 10, 17, 18. It says, For this reason the Father loves me because, he says, I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I, I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. So I think the angels, the angels basically use this little pinky and just roll, roll the grave, uh, the, the stone in front of the tomb. And so Christ was no, was no longer there. He was not there anymore. And so with the angel, he opened uh, the tomb, rolled away the stone. And it says, furthermore, regarding the angel, verse 3, it says here, and his appearance was like lightning. Have you ever looked at lightning? It's, it's, uh, it's so brief, it's so quick. But that's how the angel appeared. He was so bright in his clothing, as white as snow. And I'm reminded of Jesus himself. We're uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration. How did Jesus appear? In Matthew 17, verse 2, it says here, And he was, that is, Jesus was transfigured before them, to, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. We see evidence of that also in the book of Revelation, about the Lord Jesus Christ, how bright he was. And so I believe these are descriptions of absolute holiness. The holiness of the angel, who was a divine angel, one who was pure and holy. And we also think of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is pure and holy. A clear testimony to the women who were observing him and regarding the angel. Looking at the radiance of the angel reveals his divine origin. It would have told them, this is, he is from God, not from anywhere else. He is from God. And so, basically... Uh, causing them to listen to his words. And his radiance would validate his message to the women and to the disciples. Look at the guards. What was their response? Verse 4. And the guards, it says the two, and there are at least two there, shook for fear of him and became like dead men. What would happen if an angel appeared before us? We would be filled with fear. We would be filled with fear. But these men were not believers. Here they saw a divine being, and they shook for fear, and they were like dead men. But for us as believers, we would, of course, be filled with fear, but it would be joy, and it would be great delight, and it would move us to worship. So regarding the angel, what did he say to the women? Verse 5, it says here, The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. Why did he say that? It's because they were afraid. And who would be? They were afraid. And he says, for I know, I know, that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. They came to the tomb, not to go inside, but basically to be there and to mourn. And so you, 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 you've, you've come here to look for Jesus who has been crucified. So the angel is testifying that indeed Jesus has been crucified and was crucified. And so they came to the tomb only expecting uh, Jesus would still be in the grave. They were not thinking about him at all being raised from the dead. They were not thinking about that. And now hear the words of the angel. He says, for his task is to bring the message home that Jesus is alive. So he brings it home. He says here, verse 6 and following. <clears throat> he said, he's not here. He is not here. Secondly, for he has risen. He ha has already been raised. He says, just as he said. On many occasions in Scripture, we find Christ here and there. We read through the Gospels. Christ is foretelling what will happen to him. In Matthew 16 is one of those accounts where he says he will go. Uh, he will be arrested and on the third day rise again. And then remember that, at that occasion, Peter says, this will not happen to you. <laughs> And Christ uh, said to Peter, "Be get behind me, Satan. And so Christ did share that he would indeed rise again. Just as he said, as the angel is saying here, remember, <laughs> he's saying to, to the ladies. And then he says also, come. Come here. Come closer to me. See the place where he was lying. Look inside. Look at the, the place where he was. Notice he's not there. He's not there. And then he says afterwards, after they, they, they did this, he said, now go. Go quickly 
They'll go slowly. <laughs> I'm sure they'd be very happy to, to run because this is a wonderful message that Jesus is risen from the dead. It says, go and tell his disciples, the 11 apostles, that he has risen from the dead. He has been raised. So the angel of God was... Uh, his clothing was like as white as snow, and basically that caught their attention. Listen to his message, and now they believe his message. And so the angel is now saying, Go quickly tell his disciples that he has risen from the, from the dead, and behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee, and there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. What a great message. What a great message from the angel of God. Christ, his victory over the cross, was not a secret thing. It was public, and the angel wanted to make sure that the ladies would see the evidence that Jesus is risen. risen. The gospel is ultimately about this. The gospel is not complete without the declaration that Jesus, after making atonement for sin, rose from the dead. Now, in our culture, in our North American culture, which is basically post-Christian, the majority of Canadians... North Americans have grown up in a Christian church where we all know, we've all heard about the resurrection of Jesus. But it doesn't grip anyone. It doesn't hit home with people. Mm -hmm. hey, I've heard that before. They don't realize how profound that is. I was just thinking about this the other day. You know, with all the different nations coming to Canada, and uh, we have an opportunity to share the gospel with people and to tell them, say specifically that Jesus was dead, but he rose from the dead. He's alive. And that's something they may have heard about or may not have heard about. This is completely new to them. And this is astonishing. This is this astounding news. So Christ rose from the dead. It's something that we should, and I need to remind myself on a, on a daily basis, more and more, yes, this is, this is, this is incredible news. It's wonderful news. And so what happened to the ladies here, verse 8, and says here, and they left the tomb quickly. You know, even if the angel didn't say, go quickly, I don't know, if I was there, them, oh, I'd be running <clears throat> as fast as I could. And, and they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy. They probably had tears coming down their faces and, and ran to report it to the disciples. So this is the, the, the lady's response and this should be our response as well. This is a, a message that we ought to be running with. Why are we not running with this and sharing this with people around us? You know, it, it, it needs to grip us once again. It needs to, to shake us. We need to be filled with fear and also with great joy about the resurrection of Christ. And so I like to, to, to hear the words of the Apostle Paul regarding the matter of the resurrection of Christ. And, and I have, I'm going to read a few verses here and we'll bring it to a close. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. Years ago, I guess I heard somebody say that the death of Christ was sufficient for our salvation. That's not true. It requires his resurrection. If Christ is not raised, we have a non-faith. So 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4, Paul says, For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also receive, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He has died. And Paul wrote these words like how many decades after the, the resurrection of Christ. He says in verse 4 that he was buried. He was in the grave. He was dead. And he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Furthermore, he says, our salvation is complete with his resurrection, starting in verse 12, 1 Corinthians 15, 12 to the end, to, to verse 17 rather. And Paul says, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. So he's speaking about the final day of the resurrection, when the, the, the final judgment day, where there's going to be a general resurrection. And somehow some of the people in Corinth had this idea, there's no resurrection of the dead. So he's saying to them, listen, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Jesus, him, Jesus himself has never been raised from the dead. In verse 14, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Why preach the gospel? Why share the good news? Verse 
verse 14. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are, and we are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that, that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it, if it is true, that the dead are not raised. Verse 16. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. So there we see the evidence that the gospel includes the resurrection of Christ. Because if Christ is not raised, then Christ, our sins remain with him, and he should still, he, by, he needs to, to remain in the grave, because he, he gained victory over death, and hell itself, we have evidence that our sins are, have been purged away from him, and that's why we have everlasting life. And that's the gospel. That's the gospel. Are you saved here this morning? I can't save you. Only God can save you. And all, all I can do is point in the right direction and say, this is what the Word of God teaches. Let us rejoice this morning. <clears throat> Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. Believe. Believe on the person of Christ, and believe also in his work, in his final work, where he cried out, it is finished. Believe and trust in what he has done for you. You can't get to heaven by your own works, for by grace you have been saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, so that no man can boast. I don't boast in anything I have done. I boast only in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you boasting in him today? So let us rejoice in God's most <coughs> generous gift to us, the gift of His Son. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, the matter of the resurrection of Christ is so much more to be said. And Lord, here we have covered essentially the essential. And Lord, we rejoice in this great, the greatest act of God, which is the work of Christ on the cross, where our sins have been taken away as far as the east is from the west. And Lord, we rejoice in that through the death of Christ, we have now obtained salvation. We have received salvation forever, for eternity. It's your free gift to mankind, to humanity, for all those, again, who believe, who, who place their trust, who surrender their lives over to Christ in repentance, acknowledging their sinfulness. Now, Lord, may we take this message uh, beyond these doors to the world out there that is still in darkness. We thank you and we praise you we praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.